Hey guys, hope you and the families are well. This is 10 trading lessons from 10 legendary traders, being the 10 you can currently see on your screen. So what I've tried to do in this video is distill it down into what is the one key lesson that I've learned from each of these traders and then share it with you in this YouTube video. As you can imagine, that was quite a hard exercise because you can learn multiple things from each of these traders. I've spent hundreds of hours, if not thousands of hours with some of them studying their strategies and studying their methods. And I would suggest that you do the same. I think it be a worthwhile exercise. MarketSmith are today's video sponsor. There's a discounted trial available in the comments section below. And the duration in terms of the time that these traders span is over 120 years, close to 130 years. So what I find is quite interesting is they're pretty much all saying the same thing. And you may realize that as we run throughout this presentation. So why don't we just jump straight on into it with Richard Wyckoff. And it's all about tape reading, being actually able to distill it down what are you seeing on a price chart from a supply and demand perspective? This is where I really learned it from. And I love this quote. It's one of my favorite quotes. Three men came to Wall Street. The first always knew what was the best to buy. The second knew why it was the best to buy. But the third knew neither of these things. He only knew when to buy. He made the most money. The when. The when part is so important, which is timing. The market always tells you what to do. It tells you get in, get out, move your stop, close out, stay neutral, wait for a better chance. All these things the market is continually impressing upon you and you must get into the frame of mind of where you are in reality, taking your orders from the action of the market itself from the tape. Successful tape reading is a study of force. It requires ability to judge which side has the greatest pulling power and one must have the courage to go with that side. So it's not opinions. It's not what you're hearing on CNBC or you're reading on the front cover of the Wall Street Journal or the FTS. What is the market saying? What is the market saying? What's the stock saying? What's the group saying? And it's obviously then deeper than that. How do we go about interpreting that that we're going to do on subsequent slides? The prepara preparation of an important move in the market takes a considerable time. A large operator or investor cannot often in a single day session buy 25,000 to 100,000 shares of stock. Remember, this quote is from over 100 years ago without putting the price up too much. Instead, he takes days, weeks or months in which to accumulate his line in one or many stocks. So so this is about accumulation basis. You're going to see how it all feeds through. So what are the telltale signs of accumulation of absorption of supply? Interesting. That's what you're going to learn. Do not operate. This is maybe one of my like top three trading quotes. Do not operate for the sake of making trades, but only for the purpose of making money. It's so good. I'm going to say it again. Do not operate for the sake of making trades, but only for the purpose of making money. Well, what a quote. So you'll hear me talk on the channel about shakeout demand tails, gap down reversal bars and trigger bars. And they are really, really, really important. I've included a little bit of data from Thomas Basolsi's book, Encyclopedia of Candlestick Charts. So these are key accumulation, key absorption candlesticks. But remember, it's not just, OK, you're seeing it. Where are you seeing it? When are you seeing it? Why are you seeing it? What's it happening to in relation? Is it showing relative strength or relative weakness? So you will hear me talk a lot about these shakeout demand tails and what's going on. And when we go into the Livermore section, we start looking at charts. I'll explain them a little bit more. But keep in, keep in your mind these shakeout demand tails, variations of hammers, doji dragonflies, to curie lines. You also have gap down reversal bars that I call them which are piercing patterns, belt hole bullish, meeting lines, frosting, bullish engulfing candlesticks. You can see the reversal rates. And I think again, think about what's going on from a supply and demand perspective. With a belt hole bullish, the prior closes here, it gaps down, it opens on the low of the bar, pushes up and goes. There's an immediate presence of demand. It's really strong. Don't worry, we'll apply these to a lot of charts. As I said, I've tried to make this a running theme throughout to take you on a bit of a journey inside bars as well. Rykoff will call this the last point of supply and the last point of support, depending on which direction the next move could be. So inside bars are really important. So these are type of the entry candlesticks that I look for. Gap down reverse bar, shake out demand tells what I call trigger bar. So these can be often tight inside low volume candlesticks. So let's start taking a look. This is absolutely timeless. This is the Dow Jones on the weekly chart going back to 1926, 1927. So I know I might seem like I'm rushing it a little bit here, but I can take you through and then I'd suggest watching this video a second time and all of these lessons, all of these things will start just clicking like that. So you can see here, gap down reversal bar, gap down reversal bar, shake out demand tail, shake out demand tail, shake out demand tail, trigger bar. 
Interesting, right? What chart pattern do you see? Well, it's an ascending triangle slash, you're going to learn now about Minervini, a VCP, a volatility contraction pattern. One contraction, two contraction, three contraction, four, and then take a look around the lows. Large operators, okay, they require two things above everything else, liquidity and perceived value. So remember that Wyckoff quote that I showed you, that moves of importance, large moves take time, they take preparation. So the bigger the base, the bigger the result. This is Wyckoff's law of cause and effect. The bigger the cause, the bigger the effect. So the bigger the base, the bigger the trend in either direction, trend up and trend down. But then when you start looking at a base and you start saying, okay, wow, interesting. Around the lows, what are we seeing? We're seeing a gap down reversal bar. So the prior weekly close is here. It gaps down, it opens here, it pushes up, sign of demand, and it marks the low. Then we see another gap down reverse bar that marks the low. Over here, we see a shakeout demand tail. So this is then about developing a Bayesian mentality and being flexible up dating your decision making process and when new information becomes available okay i'm seeing this what is my interpretation of this i'm seeing this happen what does that mean how does that relate to that there's a lot of pieces of the jigsaw puzzle when you're trading you're trying to piece them all together and make some high quality decisions so if you see the major indexes or it could be a sector etf or a group etf or a theme etf so it could be semiconductors it could be soda stocks it could be oil and gas stocks it could be the major indexes you see okay wow i'm seeing a really sizable base here and as you're going to learn a little bit later on with dan zanger leading stock Stocks near 52 week highs and breaking out, really encouraging sign. So again, we're piecing it all together here. So let's go into our Livermore section, okay? Arguably just the greatest trader that's ever lived. So patterns repeat. So here's a couple of key quotes, and then we'll start going through a couple of charts. I absolutely believe that price movement patterns are being repeated. They are recurring patterns that appear over and over with slight variations. This is because the stocks were being driven by humans and human nature never changes. All through time, people have basically acted and reacted the same way in the market as a result of greed, fear, ignorance, and hope. This is why numerical formations and patterns recur on a constant basis. The pivotal point gives the only tip off you need to trade and win. A speculator has to be patient because it takes time for a stock to run its logical and natural course and form a proper, proper pivotal point. The key to my later theory of trading is to trade only on pivotal points. And you may be thinking, what on earth are they? Don't worry, next couple of slides I'm going to show you. I was a lot less active in my trading than people thought I was. In my later life, when Livermore was making fortunes, I think he made over a billion dollars on three or four separate occasions. It was like the greatest trader that's ever lived doing it with his own money as well. I was only interested in the essential move, the important swing in the price of the stock. This often took much patience and waiting for all factors to come together into a focal point where I felt as much as possible that everything was in my favor. The direction of the overall market, the industry group, the sister stock, activity and finally the timing was correct and an important pivotal point was reached i traded to beat the game and a big part was having the right timing my quest was never ending to refine and develop the pivotal point approach my approach to trading new hinds finding the industry leaders and the best industry group these theories were all developed after much experience and effort so these are the common chart patterns that I see, okay? And you'll see it in your popular trading books as well. So these are the common chart patterns. These are the main chart patterns that I trade from, okay? It's gonna be flags, it's gonna be triangles, it's gonna be pennants, cup with handles, wedges, flat base, Darvis box, VCPs, ascending triangles, whatever you wanna call them. These are the main ones. So what I wanted to do is put together around about 20 charts or so. And obviously in trading view, you can only go back. So you can only go back so far, a lot of stocks from the 1950s, 60s, 70s are now delisted as well. They've been taken over. So what I've tried to do here is just piece together a collection of around about 20 charts. And later on, we're gonna, I'm gonna show you across different, different time frames, the three minute chart, the five minute minute chart, the one hour chart, the one minute chart, pre-market chart. It's literally just the same patterns across all durations. It is supply and demand. And you'll also see that here I'm pointing GDR, gap down reversal, SDT, shake out demand tail, T, TB, trigger bar. So what you're going to notice is bases will resemble the price patterns will repeat with slight variations. And you'll also see these same candlesticks. Okay, these are the leading stocks of their day. You can see that with these blue dots here on what's called the relative strength line, not, not RSI, relative strength line. Very different things. You're going to learn about relative strength a little bit later on. Okay, but you see these 52-week highs. It's really good. Free tool on TradingView, search my name, and you will find it. But note these bases. And where is price action finding support? Is it on the black line, the 10-day EMA? Is it on the blue line, the 21-day EMA? Is it on the purple line, the 50-period simple moving average? Where are you seeing it? What type of candlesticks are you seeing? Are you seeing gap down reverse bars indicating accumulation? Are you seeing shakeout demand tap 
indicating absorption and accumulation shaking out weekends are you seeing trigger bars which indicate there's very little selling very little supply come to the market so let's go through them okay I suggest pausing this video if you want to pause them. Foot Locker, 1975. So the stock is in a powerful uptrend and then starts building a constructive base. So just know where is price finding support? What moving averages? What are the candlesticks you see? What are the common themes? What do you keep seeing time and time again with these stocks and these setups all throughout history? What are you seeing? What do you notice? It's really important. And then you can develop systems around that as well. It's really key. So let's keep going. HL. Gold mining stock, 1979. Shake out the mantel here and then see how it starts finding support on the 50. But it's not just, okay, find support on the 50 day moving average. How does it find support? What are you seeing? Are you seeing large operators step up and support the stock? Shake out the mantel, then tightness in price, low volume tells you what. There's not much supply coming to the market. Kirby Corporation, this here, VCP, high tie flag type pattern. One contraction, bounce off the 21. So where's it finding support? Bounce, bounce, bounce. Shake out the mantel, shake out the mantel. Charles Harris, as you're going to see a little bit later, would call these upside reversals. You're going to learn about that. Another one here, SGC. So you can see the stock, powerful uptrend. Where does it start finding support? What moving averages? What candlesticks do you see as well? Shake out the mantel, it's trigger bars. Interesting. SMP, shake out the mantel, undercuts base lows, then recovers. Shake out the mantels are really good for footprints of large operators. Again, you're trying to understand and follow the footprints of large operators of leading stocks. How do you know it's a leader? Look at all these 52 week highs. Look at the tightness that comes through here. This is then a cup and then a low handle. Look at the tightness. So note the tightness as well. So it's really important when you're studying stocks, okay, you want to study and understand, okay, what's happening pre-base? What's happening in the base? What's then happening post-base? Because you want to understand what are the best stocks do pre-base, what do they do in the base, what do they do post-base? Because post-base then goes into the trade management. How are you managing these trades? Okay, now this will be split adjusted 101 times, but how do you then manage a trade that goes from here to here? Can you stay on board? Are there any strategies that you can be employing? We talk a lot about 10-day EMAs, 21-day EMAs, potentially the 50-day moving average if it's a bit of a bigger stock. But look at the tightness that's coming through. Look how the volume dries up. What's that telling you? It's telling you there's not much supply. Where's the stock finding support? Interesting. SFE, VCP, one contraction, two contraction, three contraction, four. What's marking the low? Gap down reversal bar, sign of accumulation, sign of absorption. Shake out the mantel, shake out the mantel. Note the trigger bars, note the tightness in price. Look how the volume is drying up. These are really key candlesticks to be looking for. This is eBay, what's marking the lows? Shake out the mantel, gap down reversal bar, shake out the mantel, shake out the mantel, trigger bar. And then a clustering of the 10, 21 and 50 and look how the volume dries up, interesting. BHC, shake out the mantel, shake out the mantel, trigger bar. What chart pattern do you see? This is a cup and then this is a handle. Where's the stock finding support? What moving averages? Chart patterns repeat. They repeat. They're slight variations of each other, but you're starting to see the repeatable nature. NHTC, this is a cup and a handle, or you could look at it as a base on base. So here would be the cup. Here would then be the handle. Look at the type of candlesticks that you're seeing and what moving averages is the stock finding support on? What does the stock tend to do before it starts breaking out? You've seen a lot of these trigger bars, aren't you? And then you're going to learn about Tony Crabell and narrow range bars. Two bar, two bar NRs, three bar NRs, narrow range four, narrow range seven bars. Interesting. Principle of contraction and expansion. Everything is going to build upon each other. Interesting. CPE. See this? This is pretty much a Darvis blocks. Okay. Where's it finding support? Shake out the mantel. Off the 21. Tight, tight, tight. Look how the volume dries up. What's that telling you? Very little supply, very little selling pressures coming to the market. So note the contraction in price before the expansion to the upside. Interesting, right? Bitcoin, when it was $7 a Bitcoin. I'll repeat that. Bitcoin, when it was $7 a Bitcoin in 2012. Okay? $7 Bitcoin, 2012. What chart pattern do you see? It's basically a flag. Shake out to Montel off a what moving average? Interesting. 21 day EMA. Another shake out to Montel off a what moving average? 21 day EMA. When we go on to Charles Harris and upside reversals, you're going to learn about entry techniques around these kind of bars. SLS. Gap down reversal bar for what moving average? 21 day EMA. And then you can see this actually a trigger bar here, but then you get this really nice tight trigger bar. Interesting. Pantheon resources, not just US stocks, it's UK stocks. Gap down reverse bars, trigger bars, trigger bar in here, sound energy, flag type pattern, shake out the mantel, shake out the mantel, trigger bar, look how the volume dries up, what moving averages is it holding after the stock has just trended up really nicely here. So again, you want to understand what happens pre-base, post-base, or pre-base in the base and post-base. The best indication for what's going to happen post-base is what happened pre-base. 
what was the rally pre-base? Because ideally, from a trade management standpoint, if you're using a moving average as a trailing stop, you want to understand what's the previous behavior of the stock. You want to see a nice, clean trend to the upside. You don't want to see it chopping around all over the place because it's going to be a nightmare to try and manage it. AG, gold stock. Gap down reversal bar, shake out demand tail, tight inside trigger bar. Low volume, interesting. Around the 10 and 21 day EMA. ACB, cannabis stock. Gap down reverse bar, shake out demand tail of a what moving average? 21 day EMA. Trigger bar, tight, low volume, inside bar, before the big move. Contraction expansion, as you're going to learn in the Tony Corbell section. Again, patterns repeat. Slight variations, but patterns repeat. Ethereum, 2017-18. Shake out demand tail, shake out demand tail, shake out demand tail, shake out demand tail of a what moving average? 21 day EMA. Tight trigger bar, low volume, before it goes. Interesting. This one here, LIVN. Gap down reverse bar, shake out demand tail, shake out demand tail, trigger bar. And what moving averages are you seeing these GDRs and SDTs of? 21 day MA. That's interesting. AMD, gap down reverse bar, undercuts the 21 day MA, undercuts base lows, and then recovers. And then you get this tight low volume inside bar, contraction, expansion. So again, watch this video back once we have gone through it all, because you're going to be like, wow, that links with that, and that links with that, and what he was saying links to that. Interesting. PRTS. Okay, shake out demand tail, gap down reverse bar off the 10 day EMA. Look at the trend beforehand. Shake out demand tail, just holds above the 21 day EMA and then tight, 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 tight. Look how the volume dries up. Peloton, this is in 2020. Shake out demand tail off of the 21 day EMA. So undercuts 21 day EMA, closes back up there. Shake out demand tail to the 21 and then you get this trigger bar, low volume inside bar. Ethereum, 2021. Shake out demand tail, shake out demand tail, shake out demand tail. Do you know what moving average off? 21 day EMA and then you get this trigger bar over here. Look how the volume dries up before the breakout. Dogecoin, shake out demand tail off the 21 day EMA. So it undercuts, reclaims, and then look at the trigger bar, tight, low volume inside bar, and then the expansion in price. Roblox, so now we're going to look across different time frames. So we just look on the daily chart. Let's go across different time frames. Roblox, one hour chart, May 2021. Shake out demand tail, gap down reverse bar, shake out demand tail. What bars are marking the lows? Bars that indicate there is absorption, there is accumulation going on by larger operators in the market. How do you know they're larger operators? Look at the price of the stock and look at the volume being traded. It ain't retail traders. One contraction, two contraction, three contraction. Or you could look at it as a cup and a handle. Look at the tightness before the breakout. Look how the volume dissipates. Luna, one hour chart. Look at the tightness. Look at what moving averages the stock is finding sport on. Look at the tightness. Look at the volume dries up before the expansion. Patterns repeat. PLTR, three minute chart. Cup. Handle, what marks the low of the cup? Shake out demand tail, sign of accumulation, of absorption. Shake out demand tail, trigger bar, before the expansion. MBOT, five minute chart. Look how the stock powers up here and then it pulls in to the 10 and 21. Look how you get the trigger bar around those key moving averages for this time frame. Look how the volume dries up and then the same thing happens about an hour later. Tight low volume inside bar before it moves again. A G L E. This is a one minute chart of a micro biotech stock, pretty much. And what are you seeing? You're seeing the stock power higher, pull into those respective key moving averages, trigger bar, tight, low volume, inside bar with the volume drying up. And then it happens again over here. And look how the stock found support of action off the 21 day or the 21 period moving average EMA for this time period, being the one minute chart. So the daily chart. It's the same thing that keeps happening. Let's now go on to Nicholas Darvis. So as I am reading this out to you, which I think is a very important paragraph, okay, take a look at, think about Darvis, think about his strategy. Those those of you who have uh, read Darvis's book, and again, think about the market environment that that is going to work best in. And I'll give you a tip off. Darvis made the equivalent of $50 million in today's money in about 18 months during this period here. He didn't do it in this period here. So again, a lot of this is then being the right trader in the right market environment for your strategy. So question. Have the markets changed? In short, no. You see the markets are simply human, human emotion reflected in dollars. People really need to get this into his head. So this is Darvis talking. It's not about logic, company results, mathematics, but emotion. When emotion and logic collide, emotion will always come out ahead. The way I traded in the 1950s and made such fantastic money was simply the same method Livermore and Bernard Branch traded before me. I traded the same way right the right way through the 1960s and 1970s. 
and I am certain it will be the same thing going into the year 2000. Now, this is written many, many, many years ago. It's all decades ago. It's all about riding huge waves of emotion to the maximum. The big money is made from these moves. It's crazy, but we are only human. Well, you see, to me, my method had to make sense. I had to be able to explain it to my dance partner who knows absolutely nothing about stocks. His dance partner was actually his sister. And, he ha and she had to grasp the reason why it worked. In short, it had to have a lot of common sense about it. So this is Darvis's method to a T. My Darvis method was simply looking for the most in-demand stocks in the best sectors in a market not going down. I would ride them, being the stocks, as far as the ride would let me and exit when it was over. Makes sense, right? pretty simple, right? But if you ask many traders to explain their method and straight away, he was talking in the 1970s, there, straight away, they mention Elliott waves, Fib retracement cycles, etc. My question is always, so why should a stock go up because of this? I am always left with a blank expression. How interesting. He was saying this in the 1970s, and this could be like it was last week. How interesting. It's absolutely timeless. So again, Darvis started trading seven years before this period, okay? Darvis was actually trading through this market environment here and didn't realize because of an experience and naivety that he was in one of the greatest bull markets for a period of years that have ever existed found himself slap bang in the middle of the in the middle of the bull market but did he make those returns in here no market was choppy it has to be the right market environment so you want to understand about being involved in the right market environments and being involved in the leaders and riding those leaders that's what i learned from davis get in the right stocks and ride the big waves and understand that basically it's human emotion the charts are just human emotion and psychology. The market doesn't always move off reason or logic. A lot of it, especially in the short term and over months, is emotion. It's not always logic. It's not always about looking at the company fundamentals. A lot of it is logic. Remember, Darvis had another quote as well about company fundamentals. They can only tell you the past. They can't tell you the future. It's already discounted in the price. Stocks, the market is a discounting mechanism. They operate in future time. William O'Neill. So what did I learn from O'Neill? Well, obviously the can slim. So the first step in learning how to pick a big winning, a to pick a big stock market winners is to examine leaders of the past. To learn all the characteristics of the most successful stocks from these observations, you'll be able to recognize the types of price and earnings pattern these stocks develop just before their spectacular advances. So you want to study success. What did the biggest winning stocks over many, many decades do? What did they do from a price and volume perspective? Are there common fundamentals that you see? And this is how William O'Neill then created his Canslem criteria because he studied them and he went, wow, there's similar characteristics. Similar to this video, you'll realize that these 10 legendary traders, a lot of them are saying the same thing. They're just saying it in slightly different ways. And obviously, I've just taken one key lesson from each of those. Okay, a lot of them are saying the same key lessons over and over and over again. The market really is timeless. The market really does just keep repeating itself. It's just different names. Okay, so you can pause the video if you want and read about the cancelling criteria. What we do is identify companies with strong fundamentals, large sales and earnings increases resulting from unique new products or services and then buy their stocks when they emerge from proper form price consolidation periods and before they run up dramatically in price during bull markets. Doesn't that sound pretty darn similar to Nicholas Darvis and what Livermore is saying about leading stocks from leading groups. So here's a couple of examples right now. So you take a look at NVIDIA, look at the estimates coming through. This is a big old company as well. $1.1 $1 trillion market cap. Look at the estimates for 2024. 196% increase in forward guidance up. So the company goes from earning on an annual basis there, annual EPS, 77 cents to $1.23, $1.66, $2.50, $4.44, $3, $9.90, what? And then the year after, $15.77, what? This is key, okay? And they're involved in arguably the most technology, the most important technology ever created that we're still in the infancy of being artificial intelligence. Then you take a look at key metrics like the EPS growth rate on a three to five year look back, 31%, ROE, return on equity, 34%. And then you go down here and you look at the quarterly earnings and sales coming through and look at the most recently reported quarter at the time of filming this, up 429% year over year to $2.70. That is blown out of the water anything previously. And look at the sales coming through on a quarterly basis, 13.5 billion, up 101% year over year relative to anything previously. It's nearly a double. Like that is significant. And then the stock is sitting near all-time high territory, building a sizable base with a relative strength renting of 99. We take a look at Celsius. <clears throat> Look at the growth here in terms of the sales. So the quarterly sales coming through 104 million, eight quarters later, 384 million. 
take a look at the last three earnings being released. 344% year over year, 333%, 136%, 40 cents, 52 cents, 89 cents. Look at that relative to any quarterly EPS being reported. It is a massive rate of change. These are the type of things that I like to look for. So common characteristics of TML type stocks, true market leaders, read O'Neill's books, brilliant book. Stan Weinstein, the price cycle, okay? Um, again, I kind of think he got this from Richard Wyckoff, Richard Wyckoff who created the uh, the price cycle, but I wanted to do the tape reading for uh, Wyckoff. So main thing that I learned from Stan Weinstein that I also learned from um, Richard Wyckoff is stage analysis, right? The four stages that stocks go through. So I'm going to read you this purple bit down here, and then I'll show you a couple of key sides. So you should work from the large question, how is the overall market down to the smaller component, which stocks look best to buy? In between those two extremes is the middle part of the equation, which group is acting best technically? So the process unfolds in the following manner. What's the trend of the market? Which few groups look the best technically? And then once you determine that the market trend is bullish and group A acts the very best technically, the final set in the process process is to zero in on the one or two best individual stock chart patterns in that section. So market, strongest group. So you want the market in an uptrend, you then want to dial into, okay, what's your strongest group here? And then what are the leaders within that group working through that process? Here we go. So this is stage analysis. I will break it down for you. So stage one, stage two, stage three, and stage four. If you go and look at a chart, certainly on the weekly chart, and you just zoom out, you will see the cyclical nature. Such as life moves in cycles, so do a lot of stocks. So Stan Weinstein, the price cycle. Stage one, this is called basing. So after stock XYZ has been declining for several months, it eventually will lose downside momentum and start to trend sideways. What's actually taking place is that buyers and sellers are starting to move into equilibrium. Whereas previous Previously, the sellers were far stronger, which is why the stock had plummeted. Volume will usually lessen, dry up as the base forms from left to right, but often volume will start to expand late in stage one, even though price remain remains little unchanged. This is an indication that the dumping of the stock by this by disgruntled owners is no longer driving down the price. So a little change of character. The buyers who are moving in to take the stock off their hands are no are demanding no and oh, sorry. The buyers who are moving in to take the stock off their hands are no demanding, are not demanding any significant price concession. That should say, confuse myself there, didn't I? That's my dyslexia in typos. This is a favorable indication. So then we go into stage two, which if you read Menavini's book, you'll hear him talk a lot about stage two uptrends and only focusing on stocks and stage two uptrends. Where do you get it from? Stand wine seat. Again, it all just builds upon each other, basically. The ideal time to buy is when a stock is finally swinging out of its base into this more dynamic stage, such as a breakout above the top of the resistance zone and the 30-week moving average, which is the 150-day moving average on the weekly chart, should occur on impressive volume. This is the start of the advancing stage two uptrend phase. At the breakout point, which is the perfect time to buy, the reported fundamental will often be negative. Interesting. In stage two, the 30 foot with 30 week moving average usually starts turning up shortly after the breakout. The situation the situation because a buy becomes a buyer's dream because each successive rally is higher than the last. In addition, the lows on corrections are also progressively high. High highs, high lows, high highs, high lows. Definition of an uptrend. As long as all these wild springs and, and shakeouts take place above the stock's rising 30 week moving average, don't worry, everything is proceeding according to schedule for a big profit. Stage three, the upward advance loses momentum, starts to trend sideways what's going on beneath the surface is that buyers and sellers are once again about equal in strength. I would just say here, you can read this final paragraph here, what you will tend to see is an increase in volatility and kind of sporadic volume coming through in stage three. So think about kind of stage one and stage two, certainly the latter parts of a, of a stage one base is you'll actually start to see volatility invariably, invariably dry up. So a lack of volatility is a sign of accumulation and absorption and increase in volatility, especially up here is a sign of distribution. Okay, something to be on the lookout for. Stage four, is basically where you see breakdowns of the stage three distributional top and you start to see price falling below its 30 week moving average or the 150 day moving average and you'll start to see it making a series of lower lows and lower highs definition of a downtrend so tony about really 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 interesting uh, if you want to go and um, buy his book on amazon it's about 1600 quid but i will teach you here in about five minutes the keys from the book as i found it so again tony about studied the market. What does the market do? Much like O'Neill and studying the biggest winning stocks. So looking at the market as Livermore did, as Wyckoff did, and actually studying the market, not what someone else says about the market, what some talking head on CNBC says, like, what does the market do? What do stocks do? So Tony Crabell wanted to find out, well, is it better to be entering after 
expansion candlesticks, so such as a WS7, so a widespread 7 or a widespread 4, or when there have been periods of contraction. And isn't this interesting? Mark Minervini, VCP, volatility contraction pattern. So what Tony Crabell did is he tested this. So we had NR4s, NR7s, and he tested them. So a cumulative total of growth pro pro profits for the contraction patterns versus expansion patterns on the trade in the direction of the move off the open, which equals opening range breakouts, showed $710,000 for contractions on 7,313 trades and $102,000 for expansions on 7,524 trades. So what does that mean? Profits were seven times larger for opening range at breakout trades after contractions than expansions. I'll repeat that. Profits were seven times larger for opening range at breakout trades after contractions than expansions. So these type of setups here resulted in profits being seven times greater than widespread setups. Clearly, something is going on here. This suggests from these results is that one should be looking to go with a forceful move off the open after a contraction and not willing to do so after an expansion. Interesting. So then he had a couple of other setups, which he calls two bar NR and three bar NR. So a two bar narrow range and a three bar narrow range. How do you define those? So specifically, a two bar narrow range is defined as the narrowest two day range relative to any two day range within the previous 20 market days. And a three bar, three bar NR is defined as the narrowest three day range relative to any three day range within the previous 20 market days. Interesting. The psychological implications of a pattern of this type is interesting. In general, as the pattern is forming, speculators are absent. In fact, they tend to ignore a market that has contracted to such an extent. This is the point where the market is most ready to move and present an explosive opportunity. It is ironic that so little initial interest is given to the move out of this pattern. It is well-trained traders that recognize these opportunities and provide for the force that takes the market into trend. And then this is interesting. The idea behind this pattern being two bar and three bar NRs, narrow ranges, originated from Wyckoff's last point of supply or last point of support. So interesting that Wyckoff, who was around maybe 80, 80 years ago, 70 years before Tony Crabell was, was um, kind of actively started his trading career, he studied Wyckoff works and Wyckoff's work about the last point of supply. So what was I telling you earlier about these tight trigger bars? These trigger bars on low relative volume that are often low volume tight inside bars. It tells you there's not much, there's not much selling pressure. There's not much supply coming to the market. It's all just building upon itself. Everyone's basically saying the same thing. Fascinating, right? So this one here, Mark Minervini. What did I learn the most from Minervini? Risk management, I would say. So there's a simple way to avoid a huge loss in a stock. Sell when you have a small loss. In four decades of trading, I haven't found a better way to manage risk. The reasons many traders and investors sell, fail to do this is ego or poor understanding of risk. If you want to mitigate risk effectively, you simply must acknowledge that stocks don't manage themselves. You are the manager and it's up to you to protect your hard earned capital. So we've got some different scenarios here, okay? So we've got a trader with a 50% win rate, 14% average gain, 7% average loss. Okay, nice two to one. Scenario two, 40% win rate, same 14 percent gains so they have four winners they have six looters so they have a 40 percent win rate but again their gains are twice the size of losses they still come out ahead even over here okay this trade here he only has three winning trades out of ten so he has a 30 percent win rate but look how he controls the reward to risk okay three times greater still comes out ahead scenario four 40 percent win rate this time a little bit more sporadic in terms of the wins a 50 percent win a 15 percent win a 10 percent win and a five percent win and then the losses are minus three percent and minus five percent comes out way ahead this is also the importance, I think, of getting the big ones right, as Diver said, riding the wave of emotion. Another slide here, with each buy order I enter, I know the exact price where I'm going to sell at a loss if things don't work out expected. I define this price level before I get in. So look at this here, okay? Scenario one, 50% win rate. This trader has a 50% win rate. They have a gain of 3%, 6%, 9%, 12%, 15%. These are compounded return on investment figures, by the way. Okay, so this is putting 100% of your account into a trade, which you may or may not want to do, right? And certainly if you know anything about risk management. But they have, their losses are out of hand. Minus 10, minus 15, minus 20, minus 25, minus 30. They lose 10 trade compound and return on investment. They've lost half the money in 10 trades. Not good. Scenario number two, 50% win rate. And they're like, well, my, well, my gains are really good. I'm 50%, 50% right. So I'm right half the time, which is good. It's very good. And my gains are 25%. Why am I not making any money? Well, look over here. They've lost nearly a third of their capital because their losses are way out of hand. Losses work geometrically against you. Okay, once you start going above 10%, they work really geometrically against you. So their losses are 25, 25, 25. So they're winning 
in terms of percentages, the same amount as their losses. But look at this here. This is important to really understand the metrics. So here's a slide, right? The goal for optimal stop loss placement is to set it at a level that will allow the stock price enough room for normal fluctuation, but close enough to the danger point that it's not too much risk mathematically. So you can pause the video here if you want to. I call it the Goldilocks zone, okay? So you want to understand what is the optimal risk to reward at different ratios, at two to one, at three to one. Okay, you want to understand this. And then you want to reverse engineer it and think about your strategy. Think about the systems. Think about the implementation of those systems into your routine. There's four key parts to every single trade. When you distill it down, for me, it's, it's logical. It's obvious. There's four parts. Number one, you've got to identify a high quality setup. Number two is you've got to initially control the risk to help create asymmetric reversible trading opportunities. Number three, mitigate the risk to free roll the take, trade, take the risk out. Number four, optimize the profits. What selling rules and guidelines are you using to help you optimize the profits? So this here, this then factors in and builds into your strategy to know what is optimal to compound capital. Really, really important stuff. This one here, Charles Harris. So unconventional reversal entries, another way to enter leading stocks. So Charles Harris calls these upside reversals. I call them gap down reverse bars, shake out demand tails and things like that. And over here, you actually have a really nice trigger bar. So this is Lululemon. This is Charles's quote when he's talking about this stock. So note the 21 day EMA, which is the blue line, is, can, is mainly containing most of the action here as the base is building. So this is the base that is building here. You get these little shakeouts below it. But again, we get this upside reversal pretty much at the 21 day EMA. And you can add on these levels here being upside reversals. It's shaking out and giving you opportunities to buy on weakness but it's weakness that is then showing you strength because of the candlestick remember what we started off with wyckoff understanding accumulation absorption what does it visually look like these kind of candlesticks look at this bar here it's a belt hold you would have learned about that okay from the wyckoff section gaps down opens on the low undercuts of 21 push up immediate presence of demand shake out demand out undercuts base lows nice shake out the weekends leading stocks are trying to go high with the fewest amount of people on and then you start basing and then note remember what we were talking about tony crabell's work about contraction expansion note the contraction in the final part of this base before the expansion interesting so this is a little bit more in terms of in terms of uh, upside reversals so i will read the guidelines here for you and you can read the the other part so 10 day ema guidelines okay typically or the 10 day moving average uh, i use the 21 day ema and the 10 day EMA. typically too close to the price action except for very powerful stocks use 10 day ema and upside reversals off this level for small pyramid buys only this is what charles is saying use more as a means to keep you in the stock as opposed to an area to accumulate shares 21 day ema guidelines many stocks abide by the 21 day EMA for an extended period of time. Use pullbacks to the 21 day EMA and upside reversals to accumulate shares. Many pullbacks to the 21 day EMA will be 10 to 15% off their highs, which is sufficient to pyramid more aggressively than buying off the 10 day moving average. 50 day moving average guidelines. Classic support area most leading stocks will revisit multiple times during a big run. Often contains the entire advance of some of the biggest model book stocks. And obviously, Charles is a uh, is a trader for William O'Neill and, uh, and company and has been for many many years so again study the stocks charles studied um livermore's work no doubt but potentially wyckoff's work as well but certainly um certainly william o'neill's work in terms of what do the biggest stocks do and he helped put some of the model books together as well so what do these model book stocks do when do they find support and then in terms of where are they finding support or well, what are the characteristics that you're seeing from a price and volume perspective to lead you to the conclusion that this stock is being supportive i want to buy here i don't want to buy here what are you seeing so that's where the tape reading element comes in as well Here's another example for Skyworks. You'll notice in this consolidation, we have three pullbacks again supported by the 21 day EMA. This is Charles saying this. So you can take advantage of these pullbacks, the 21 day EMA, on these upside reversals. If you like, you can also add a pyramid into strength as it is priced clearly, these short, as price is clearing these short lines of resistance. But you see here, gap down reversal bar, shake out tomato, shake out tomato. And then what do you notice happens? Look at this. This is like an NR4 over here. If you using Tony, Tony Crabell's vernacular. Look at this, tight inside bar, low volume. Look how the volume dries up before the expansion in price. It is fascinating. This one here, Dan's anger. So concentration and timing, leaders lead. This is really, really key, so key. Question, so this is by the interviewer. 
What keys do you look for to identify a market that may be bottoming? What are some of the things that really give you a heads up that the market is about to take off? Leadership, this is Dan's answer. Leadership stocks will be sitting near new highs, such as Google, and I've lined these charts up here, I'll come on to them. While the market looks like it's cascading down and almost in an inverse parabolic-like parabolic curve, and then you'll find Google sitting near new highs, like where we see it here in October 2005, okay? So look at this point here, okay? October 2005, this is where Dan's talking. So look at the market. The market doesn't look too good down here, but Google is sitting near 52-week highs and all-time highs. Leaders lead. Or could be something like Apple, which you're going to see on the next slide, sitting near 52-week, sitting near new highs and making new highs. Stocks with powerful earnings that come out and then the market and then the stocks will explode. Meanwhile, the market is still trying to grab its legs and the market will lag these leading stocks. And that's why they're known as leaders. I think the market is a lagging tool. This is another quote from that. So if I'm going to wait for the market to take off and break a trend line or break for a resistance point or something, my leading stocks have already gone. So again, the leadership stocks are leading and then the market will get up and follow that leader. So I focus in on the leading stocks first with the big earnings. And Dan Zanger studied William O'Neill's works extensively in terms of leading stocks can slim true market leaders and then if we go here this is apple so same time october 2005 apple is near all-time high territory 52 week high territory how do you know it's a leader well the market is down here pretty much on its lows and apple is here trying to break into all-time high 52 week high territory and look at the 52 week highs on the relative strength line the market will not miss the best opportunities relative strength it's not your opinion it's not my opinion it's the opinion of the market and the market just doesn't miss the best opportunities there's another quote from um, from nicholas darvis there's too many hawk-eyed investors in the market to miss the best opportunities the big lesson for me this year 2005 has been trade less trade fewer stocks own just about four stocks that are really powerhouse stocks when the market bottoms out and then the market will take off and run for maybe 10 12 13 14 weeks whatever it does and then just trade out and go to golf go to swimming go to cash just have fun and enjoy and wait for everything to set up and do it again it takes about four or five months for everything to set up again it took me more than six years of studying at least 30 hours a week before it all came together once or twice a day i manually scan about 1500 stocks there is a tremendous amount of hard work involved in this. This one here, Kuala Maggie, so we'll finish with this. So this is about staircases, how stocks move and really understand how do stocks move? How do financial instruments move? I'm going to show you the Dow Jones here on the yearly chart. And in a couple of slides time, I'm going to show you Ethereum. It's the same thing. It's the, uh, as the quote here says, it's the same thing. A big move and then a pullback or sideways consolidation and then the stock or potentially market index here or cryptocurrency starts finding support or surfing one of the moving averages. It could be the 10 day, the 20 day or the 50 day. And many times it's a combination of the two of them, usually the 10 and 20 day. Then it gets tighter and then it breaks out of that range tighter. Think about Tony Crabell, narrow ranges, contraction and expansion. It's just the same theme over and over. <clears throat> This is how stocks move. This is how stocks have moved over the past 100 years. Go back and look at charts at the 1920s, 1950s, 80s, 90s. They do the same thing over and over. You just need to memorize these patterns. What was Livermore telling you? Stocks move like stairs, leg higher sideways, leg higher sideways. We are trying to identify the areas where the next step higher could be formed. Tight areas, we're looking for tight areas where we can get a tight stop and a good risk to reward. Think about the Minervini point I was teaching you. This is how stocks have moved for 100 years and there's no reason why they shouldn't stop moving like this. <clears throat> I read a book by William O'Neill, How to Make Money in Stocks, and that's where I really got the idea that stocks move in the same patterns that they have done for 100 years. I realized, wow, it's the same patterns. Nothing is different. It was the same patterns in the early 1990s and even the late 1800s. It was the same patterns in the 50s, the 80s, the 90s, and it's the same patterns now. So here you go. Here's the stair step. This is Celsius and EXPI. Do you see the stair step? Okay, it goes up, pulls in, goes up, pulls in, goes up, pulls in. Here with EXPI, it goes up, pulls in, goes up, pulls in, goes up, pulls in. Over here as well. Remember what I said about the best indication of how a stock is going to move in the future? How did it move in the past? This is all about understanding the behavior of a stock. Darvis was talking about this decades ago. See how the stock goes up, pulls in, goes up, pulls in. Then what moving averages is the stock finding support on? Interesting. The 10 day, the 21 day. Interesting. Look here, the 10 day, the 21 day. Interesting. Celsius. 10 day, 21 day. 10 day, 21 day. What type of candle six you seeing? Gap down reversal bar. Shake out the mantos. Upside reversal bars if you want to use what Charles Harris calls them. Trigger bars. 
It's the same thing. You need to, so this one here, this is basically how they form these, these type of patterns. How do they form? A big move higher in the past one to three months, anywhere from 30 to 100 plus percent. And usually the rally lasts a few days to a few weeks. Orderly pullback and consolidation with higher lows and tightening range. So you see how it powers here and then it pulls back. So it's generally speaking, building higher lows and a tightening range, tightening range. Tony Crabell's point, a, a contraction and expansion. A breakout of the consolidation. The consolidation phase is usually two weeks to two months. During the consolidation, the stock surfs the rising 10 day and or 20 day and sometimes the 50 day moving average. So if we were to look at this one here, with Celsius gets moving up, finding support of action around those key moving averages. Here, the 50 is kind of catching up as well. If I go forward one more onto Ethereum, you can see the same stair step nature of Ethereum cryptocurrency. So whether it's the Dow on a yearly chart or whether it's Ethereum on a daily chart, it, it's literally they're just moving the same thing. The moving averages are different, as you'd expect, with a daily chart versus a yearly chart, but it's the same concept of stair steps. It's how they move, okay? Stocks, cryptos, and all assets classes, <clears throat> they move like stairs. This is how they move, generally. They make a move, and they go sideways or pull back, make another move, go sideways or pull back, make another move. This is how stocks move. Study any stocks that are up hundreds or thousands of percent over years. This is how they move. They move in stairs. Our job is to buy it at the exact time it starts to build the next step higher. I'm not going to be 100% correct. My win rate is 25%. This is Kuala Maggie talking. The key is about small losers, big winners. Then you get the moving averages, the 10-day, the 20-day, and the 50-day, the leading stocks keep surfing those moving averages so that is it guys that is 10 trading lessons from 10 legendary traders i hope you have found that video useful and it helps you with your trading please do like the video if you've got value from it please consider subscribing to the channel for more videos like this thank you very much for watching i look forward to seeing you in a future video